it is estimated that about two billion people will be watching the Olympic Games in London next week. And their motivation for, it's a really uh, remarkable number, their motivation for doing that is no doubt partly the fun of the Games, uh, watching the body in action, the uh, beauty of the human body, the, the concentrated mind that produces these actions, but there is another reason, I suspect, and that is that the sort of uh, sports arena that the Olympic Games are is an arena for the exercise of will and determination and the pursuit of perfection and excellence. And these are attributes which can be translated into uh, all our activities. And hence, there is an inspiration that we derive from seeing uh, people uh, succeed when they have tried, uh, because we can try in our own smaller fields to do the same. So we're going to talk tonight about the Olympic Games, but in a broad general context of plasticity. And uh, with me is Heidi Johansson Berg, a very distinguished uh, professor of cognitive neuroscience at Oxford and also a senior uh, Wellcome Trust Research Fellow whose specialty is studying the motor cortex. So Heidi, let's start off by <coughs> looking at two, two sayings. One comes from the greatest neurobiologist of all time, namely the Spanish uh, Santiago Ramón y Cajal, who said that the founts of growth and regeneration terminate when the brain is developed. Everything comes to an abrupt end. And the other one is a saying which is attributed to the Society of Jesus, but it's not a correct attribution because somebody else came up with it, is give us a child to the age of seven and then you can have him for life. Or give us a child to the age of seven and we will give you the man. Which Sigmund Freud later translated into, the, uh, into his saying that the child is the father of the man. Now neither of these statements is uh, correct, but neither is wrong either. So can we just begin by looking at um, the brains of athletes, of very elite athletes, is uh, developing them, uh, do their brains uh, develop the skills or are they born with these skills in the way that mathematicians and uh, linguists and musicians are often born with these skills? Okay. Well, these predispositions, rather. Sure. So I think, I mean, it is true that if you look at the brains of athletes, they do seem to be um, rather special, at least certain types of athletes. So if you use brain scanning, for example, you can compare the brains of um, elite athletes to those of um, regular people. And there are specific brain regions which seem to be enlarged or uh, greater in the athletes compared to the non-athletes. And that depends on the, on the nature of the skill. So, for example, if you were to look at an elite golfer, they tend to have more grey matter, more cortex in the frontal areas of the brain, the parietal areas of the brain that are involved in um, spatial judgments. And that makes some sense given the nature of the, the sport that they're expert in. But what's unclear from that is whether those specialisations were present from birth or whether that's the result of the many hours of practice that they, that they have put in. And I mean, I think it's... Um, generally accepted that to become truly expert in any domain, whether it's sports or music or um, other types of specialism, that what's essential really is that practice. So it's said that um, you know, if you put in 10,000 hours, hours of practice over 10 years, then that's what you need in order to attain that level of um, extreme expertise that would characterize an Olympic athlete, for example. Mm -hmm. But uh, is there in... The, in uh areas outside sport, for example, in, in mathematics and in language and in uh, uh, vision and in um, maternal love, etc. There is a critical period. So everything is specified and there genetically at birth, but if the uh, newborn is not exposed during this critical period, uh, then the capacity atrophies. And these critical periods vary uh, between different um, uh, in different domains. For example, I think that in, in case of vision, the critical period is about three to seven weeks immediately after birth. If the uh, human infant is not exposed to vision at this period, then it is almost forever blighted in one way or the other. Uh, for maternal love, uh, these are Harry Harlow's uh, fantastic experiments. Uh, if 
the uh, monkey is deprived of its mother, uh, then it becomes uh, very abnormal its behavior, and no amount of exposure to the mother after the critical period uh, uh, restores its uh, emotional stability. Is there such a thing for sport? Well, um, I'm not sure about sport specifically. I mean, it does seem that the, there are critical periods for certain types of, of learning as well, of which um, sport could be an example. So one classic uh, example of that would be in songbirds, for example. So if an mm -hmm. immature songbird isn't exposed doesn't hear the adult song before it reaches sexual maturity, it, would never, it will never be able to learn that song oh. in adulthood. So even though it doesn't itself produce the song as, a, as an immature bird, it needs to have had that input during that critical period in order to later be able to learn the output itself. Um, in the field of sports expertise, I think it's an interesting one. There doesn't, although many, many sports people started early in their sport, it, I don't think that those same critical periods exist. There are some that there are many examples of people, for example, who train in a particular sport, but then later on change sport completely to a sport that might require quite different cognitive skills and would presumably require quite different brain mechanisms, and yet they are able to switch and, and learn a new skill even relatively late in Could you give us examples of what kind of sport they switch from? So, for example, someone, <coughs> might, someone might switch from um, cycling to rowing or from swimming mm -hmm. to, to cycling. So the very, very different... Um, motor skills and visuomotor skills involved in those tasks and maybe that gives us some clue as to what's special about athletes perhaps it's less so much it, it's perhaps it's less the specific movement repertoire and maybe it's more psychological factors like um, motivation to put in those hours of training or ability to cope under the, uh, the pressure of a mm -hmm. um, you know, high pressure performance so it might be some of those more generic psychological characteristics, yes. if you like, or personality yeah. traits that could characterise a potential expert athlete as opposed to the um, yes. motor the, the equivalent experiment has not been done in the motor system that, that had been done in the, in the visual system. The, the um, people born with congenital cataract. Uh, the, 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 the operations of congenital cataract were, were actually perfected in the 1930s uh, in Germany. And when they operated on these uh, children at the age of 9, 10, 11, they were restoring vision to them, restoring in, in quotes, did not help them at all. They, they could not see. There is no equivalent experiment in the, in the motor system of immobilizing people at birth. So. No, I mean, certainly, though, types of damage to the motor system, whether that be peripheral damage or, or central damage to the motor system, that there, it is the case that the younger brain has far greater capacity to recover Mm -hmm. from that damage that then an older brain would. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just, just in case uh, anybody's in the dark there, uh, redefine the critical period. Uh, it is a period during which uh, all the apparatus that's needed to undertake a function is there, present and functioning. But if it is not nourished, then it atrophies. And uh, if it is done during that, if, uh, if not nourished during that critical period, then the capacity is never, never regained at all. So in the case of uh, vision, if you deprive somebody of vision through natural causes or artificially um, uh, during this few weeks or months after birth, then they are forever blind. And if you deprive a, a child of contact with the mother, then they become forever uh, abnormal. Now, it, it is you can deprive an adult of vision and it be fine. It's only during this critical period that the brain is extremely sensitive. And you're saying that in the um, motor system, there is no such equivalent uh, critical period that anybody has uh, found. No, no, not that I'm aware of. It seems that um, you know, one retains the ability to learn very novel um, movements even, even much later on in development and later on in life. Okay. Let us talk a bit about the, the uh, plasticity of the uh, motor system. First of all, is it not true that there are certain parts of the motor uh, uh, apparatus of the brain which are much more plastic than others? Is, is, is this true? Well, there are, there are certain parts of the motor system that are particularly um, specialized for learning. So the cerebellum would be a, a classical example. So the cerebellum, which sits at the back of the brain here, mm -hmm. seems to be particularly uh, well-equipped for learning. It has a... Um, very special type of circuitry that lends itself very much to, to skill learning. Um, but many different areas of the motor system have been shown to change. So the motor cortex, classically, 
is, is an area that's been the focus of many of the classical experiments showing changes that happen with learning. So the motor cortex is characterised by, um, by representational maps, so you can map out different bits, different parts of the body travelling along this motor strip, so it provides you with a very nice framework within which you can look at change. You can mm -hmm. literally look at expansion or contraction in the size of those motor cortical maps. But if you take the, the uh, m let's just take the example of, of serious damage to the motor cortex um, of both sides in the human. Um, there is a paralysis, but it is not quite as severe as that, is it? I mean, it's not as bad as damage to the cerebellum, which leads to ataxia. And, uh... No, so it seems that the motor cortex is, um, the motor cortex and its projections to the spinal cord, they, they are particularly required for the... Um, for fine movement, so for example, um, hand movements and, and digit movements. So it's those more um, skilled movements that are lost as a result of cortical damage, whereas some of the more um, inbuilt movements like walking, for example, or balance seem to depend more on, if you like, more primitive brain systems, these deeper brain structures. Mm -hmm. So, so what, is it, what is it that is uh, loss in, uh, uh, after motor uh, unilateral one-sided motor cortex damage? So depending on the um, precise location of the damage, patients will often have um, impaired movements on the opposite side of the body because one um, motor cortex projects to the muscles on the opposite side of the body. Um, as I say, the, mo the, the, the most severe damage will often be with these individuated um, mm -hmm. finger movements. So patients mm -hmm. often will recover some degree of movement after a stroke, but the very last thing to come back would be these fine finger movements, picking up a paper clip, for example, yes. from a table, would be extremely, extremely difficult. Um, so it's those uh, skilled movements that, that are the hardest thing to get back. Yes. What about this uh, damage of the spinal cord? That's much more severe, isn't it? Yes, for sure. And again, so that would depend on the level at which the damage occurred as to, um, as, as okay. to which movements were lost. And the cerebellum? And so the cerebellum seems particularly important for, for things like balance and for acquisition of skill. And, and recovery from that? Is, is, diff is, is far less studied, actually, than the motor cortex. So the vast majority of the work that's been done has, fo has focused on motor cortex. Um, that there's less work done on, on yes. um, patients with yes. cerebellum. So is it known what determines the degree to which different parts can, can uh, recover? So there are many factors that come into play. So obviously the, the, the size of uh, the extent of the damage will be important, the location of the damage. Um, which pathways are left intact. So an interesting thing about the motor system um, is that it's characterised by... Um, there are, very many, there are very, very many different motor areas. So we talk about the motor cortex, but there's also you know, there's five or six other areas of the cortex which also send signals to the muscles. So there's many different routes by which a motor command could get from the brain to the muscles. So depending on which of those routes are intact, which of those routes are damaged, that will dictate how much residual brain is left that could potentially control the movements of the body. I would like to explore something which is relatively new, uh, and that is, you see, uh, it used to be thought that the motor cortex and the cerebellum, the spinal cord, and the subcortical motor nuclei, and these collectively form the R motor system, with the cerebellum uh, uh, contributing balance and uh, motor cortex will movements. But it turns out that, that, that the motor part of the brain is extremely large and, and there are uh, motor planning systems and motor uh, affective motor planning systems as well, ones which are involved in uh, emotional motor planning. I also understand that, that the emotional uh, environment can influence motor activity very significantly. Would you like to tell us a bit more about that? Yes, yeah, so there's certainly, there are, <coughs> there are loops, if you like, between these deep brain structures and the cortex. So there's certain areas um, a region of the brain called the, the striatum, which is very much involved in um, reward and motivation. And that, that talks to the motor cortex in these circuits and loops such that um, the learning of a novel movement can be very heavily influenced by reward characteristics, which is interesting in the context of um, sports training or in the context of rehabilitation, that potentially by uh, influence, by changing the, how rewarding a particular um, training regime is, that would have um, quite significant effects on its outcome. So if you can make a training environment much more rewarding to the participant, then you start to recruit these 
uh, circuits between the cortex and the striatum, yes. which might really push that reward-based. Um, but I wonder how much in uh, in a situation like the Olympic Games, the the emotive effect of competition, perhaps of hatred, and perhaps of uh, the will to win, actually contribute towards. Uh, uh, mobilizing the motor system through the emotional motor system. Is, is this, has this been studied? I do, um, I'm not aware of that having been looked at systematically. I mean, I'm sure that the, the, you know, the sports psychologists, I'm sure, have looked ex very extensively into how performance varies between, you know, on the day of the competition versus in training. And, you know, classically, we all know, we've all seen England lose at penalties uh, endlessly. So there's, there's something, players who will, you know, 100% success of scoring their penalty in the training uh, ground will nevertheless choke when it comes to doing it in the European Championship semi-finals. So you know, there's clearly very different um, things at work here, and while some people can rise to the challenge, uh, others can't. And that can't just be about genetics. That must partly be to do with the, the training. So you know what's different about the German training system versus the English training system? And has this been studied in terms uh, I'm, of... Birth? I'm not aware of it. I, I would think that there's a... Uh, I mean, the, 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 the East German, uh, the, uh, many years ago, before Germany was reunited, the East German uh, government, of course, spent a lot of money, as did the Russian government, spent a lot of money on training to, uh, but they also used hormones and stuff mm -hmm. like that to build up uh, athletes who could get as many gold medals as possible. Well, let's just talk about the, the uh, effects of damage a bit more. I gather that if you have unilateral damage to one side, how common are these damages to, 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 to the motor cortex actually in the population? So, well, well stroke, um, I can't think off the top of my head what the instance would be, but it, it, it rarely directly affects the motor cortex. What tends to happen is that you would have a, a stroke that would affect some of the outputs of the motor cortex. So actually, strokes that directly impact on the motor cortex are, are, are pretty rare but often patients would have um, strokes in the white matter. That's um, the word we use to describe the connecting pathways of the brain. And they would basically interrupt that output pathway from the brain um, to the muscles. But do these, so, so during the period of recovery, do you get a regeneration of cells or uh, an importation of new cells? What, what happens? What are the sequence, what are the sequence so, of So, well, events? the question of regeneration of cells is a very interesting one, which comes back to how you began the discussion, this idea that there are old dogmas which are beginning to get to some extent overwritten, although not entirely so. So, you know, for many, many years it was thought that the adult brain was unable to generate new neurons. Um, and that's of relevance both in the context of the discussion of damage that we're having now, but also more generally to learning and memory and mm -hmm. uh, change over time. It, it's becoming clear that actually there, it, there is capacity for the adult brain to generate new neurons, but it's it's not nearly as ubiquitous as, as that is during development and that it's um, to some extent localized in, in specific regions of the brain. Um, but in terms of what happens following, uh, following a stroke, it seems that the, um, what, rather than growth of new neurons, it seems that the neurons that are left intact might, might change in some way, new connections might develop. So I think a far more common type of change is that the surviving cells would change their connections with other cells. But the, the new connections established are not always uh, to advantage, are they? I mean, uh, I gather that, that sometimes very abnormal connections are formed, and sometimes when you have got unilateral damage to the cortex, then there's an imbalance between the two motor cortices so that whatever regenerates here is, is, is opposed by what's functioning normally, and, and it, it leaves the person in a worse condition. Yeah, that can happen. So normally, the so there are, we have a motor cortex in both sides of the brain, and um, predominantly they tend to inhibit one another. And in a healthy person, that works out quite well, and it allows you to uh, perform unilateral movements. And the two motor cortices are, um, inhibit each other. If you take out, uh, if you impair one of those motor cortices through stroke, for example, then the intact surviving motor cortex might uh, disproportionately um, inhibit the stroke-affected hemisphere. So you get this tip of the balance. So where in a normal brain, those two things um, are in balance with one another, you reduce the output of one side of the brain, and the healthy side of the brain increases its activity. That has the effect of further inhibiting the, the stroke side of the brain. And as you say, you tip things completely out of kilter. And if you reinforce that by becoming more and more reliant on the uh, healthy side of the brain, 
that can become something of, of a vicious cycle. So, <coughs> but it's complicated. It, it, it's a, uh, it can be that if there was a patient in whom there really is no residual output from the stroke-affected hemisphere, all they have to rely on is that healthy hemisphere, and therefore it's worth um, cultivating that. Whereas in a patient in whom there's some scope for them returning to a more, ba a more normal pattern of activity, then for sure that's, that's the best thing to try to achieve. Yes. Let's talk a bit about the Paralympics and, and, and uh, what uh, you imagine that happens in, in those situations, how much reorganisation takes place. And well, it seems that there's phenomenal scope for reorganisation if somebody, for example, has the, the loss of a particular sense. So if um, there's interesting evidence to show that in, um, in people uh, who are blind, for example, that the visual cortex at the back of the brain starts responding to different um, types of sensory input. So it seems that although uh, much of the circuitry of the brain is pretty um, hardwired, the, the basic planning, the wiring diagram is, is pre-specified from birth, that you can override that to some extent with um, either a congenital or a very early acquired loss of a particular sensory input. Does, does this happen uh, if somebody is born blind, the, the visual cortex is there and it's invaded by other senses. What happens if they become blind? It seems that... The, uh, and yeah, they the, depend more on their, on their sensory input. Yeah, so it seems that, the, the, that people who become blind later in life can develop um, very high levels of expertise with, other, with different types of non-visual sensory input, but that there's less capacity for the for that dramatic rewiring that you see in early blind people. For the, there's less capacity for the visual cortex to start responding to a completely different sense. So do I take it that if you were to uh, look at the brains of, of um, uh, the elite in the Paralympic Games, you're, you're going to find significant differences from those of uh, uh, people not damaged? It would be interesting to see whether, um, in some cases, whether some of those athletes have to some extent capitalised on that possibility of sort of super skill in, an, in another sense in the event of um, loss of one of the uh, standard sensory yeah. inputs. So it would be interesting to see whether they, um, yeah. I would have thought that their abilities in other sensory domains would far outweigh people with um, intact sensory input. So given what you, you know about the motor cortex uh, today, uh, do you think that developments in medicine and in, in biology are going to help people uh, in that situation a lot? Or how, how do you see the uh, future for those who are passionate about sport but who are disabled in one way or the other? I think that there's um, increasing possibilities for people to, um, to, en to engage in these sports in different ways and as um, things like technology develops and training strategies develop that uh, you know, some of the abilities of the athletes in the Paralympic Games are, um, are phenomenal, and some of the athletes I know, you know have had success even in uh, even in the standard competitions in the past. So I think that there's um, that there's fantastic scope for, for athletes. On and side. are they being studied? Uh, I mean, are the brain because it's quite an interesting uh, yeah, subject not, for medicine and biology. Are absolutely, they? I've I've not seen studies specifically on um, on athletes in the Paralympic. Side. I mean, there's many studies on people with, um, with, with sensory loss of one type or another or people with um, limb amputation or congenital limb absence, for example, and there are very interesting observations on the effect that that would have on the representations in their motor cortex and their sensory cortex. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me just summarise so far. There is no critical period, as far as we know, for uh, athletic skills. Is that right? I think that's right. Uh, but, but training at an early age is important. I would say total. what's important is total duration of training rather than how early you begin that training. That it's the, you know, it's the classic 10,000 hours plus rule yes. that you need to have the, the motivation and the drive to put in those phenomenal hours of training, but that it it's not necessarily the case that that has to start before the age of eight or something, I even see. though the vast majority of athletes would probably have begun their sport early on because they would have shown an interest in it. I think there are also cases of people who've come to a sport late but put in the hours and then got to a level of expertise. So you think that for a person like me, there is some hope of... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think, I mean, it's, it's interesting, actually, that I think that e there's uh, very compelling emerging data now that... Um, 
people who take up any physical activity, you know, sporting activity, or even just you know, going to the gym later in life, that can have um, significant beneficial effects on the brain. Yes. It might not get them to the Olympics, possibly, but uh, yes, yes. certainly it, it seems to increase brain health as well as, as yes. body health. Well, let's talk a bit about training, because it's, it's also true of pianists. I mean, pianists have to train every day. They do train. Violinists do, too. But, but uh, somebody, uh, I mean, I suppose, like Roger Federer, it's going to, he also presumably trains every day. So there is something impermanent. Uh, if he stops training, there's something that changes, something atrophies. What is it? Is this known? <coughs> well, I think that the, uh, it, it's, it is certainly the case that if you, um, even if you are a very, have a high, very high level of expertise in a particular skill, say tennis, if you stop practicing, that skill will atrophy. And presumably what's happening in, um, in brain terms there is that the high level of skill that you had acquired is effectively represented in the pattern of connections between your brain cells. So all those hours and hours of practice that Roger Federer puts in on his backhand literally rewires his motor cortex such that the representations of the muscles involved in that stroke will be connected up in the right way in the right sequence so that every time he tries that stroke regardless of his starting posture and the position of his opponent and all these different factors, he'll produce this beautifully perfect backhand. If he stops practicing that, then those, those connection weights, those connection <coughs> strengths will start to return to baseline, if you like, or they'll get written overwritten by other experiences that he's happening. So, I'm, so what is the baseline? Well, so the brain is continually in a state of... Of, of flux, all of our brains are, are dynamically changing all of the time, and these the synapses, the connection points, the junction points between brain cells, change their strengths with with every experience that we have. So there's always the possibility for any learning that you've um, undertaken to be overwritten, basically, by mm -hmm. other experiences that you have in future. I see. So what about? Uh, I mean. Mm all tennis players and, and all players, football players, to change their tactics every now and then. Uh, Federer changed his tactics in the last tennis, the, the Wimbledon one. So uh, you uh, get accustomed to certain backstroke, whatever it is, but then you suddenly have to change. What happens then? Well, that, I, I think sometimes that can be a good thing. So if you look at the, the data on um, how practice translates into performance, it seems that... Um, to some extent, contrary to our intuitions, you can, you can keep getting better and better and better, even with many, many, many long hours of performance. But what uh, <coughs> gives you a real boost is that you have a change in strategy. So, for example, you often see this with sports people. When they change their coach, suddenly their performance uh, rockets up or down. And part of, that, you know, part of that might be all kinds of social and psychological factors, but part of it might be the new coach giving them some new strategy or some new way of doing things, which then gives them a step change um, in their performance levels. So I think that, that that ability to adapt the strategy that you take um, can, give, can give athletes that competitive advantage. But if you take a, 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 an ace uh, champion like uh, Federer or Pete Sampras, one of these people, they must have developed a certain technique. And if they're suddenly asked to reverse that technique, uh, it, it must in, uh, entail an unlearning. Yes, yeah. I mean, un if you get into a bad habit, let's say, and you... No, um, no, but it's a good habit, which they've been winning with, except right. that they've suddenly encountered another ace champion who's got yes. better technique. Yes, so they're suddenly up against the Dow and yes. you have to change yes. that. Yeah, so I think if you... It, learning a, a different way of doing things can, conf can give you that step change and give you that boosted advantage. But if it does involve un effectively unlearning a previous habit, then that then that's hard because that the learning of your first mm -hmm. strategy will be present in the weights between the brain in the connections between the brain cells. So you've to you know in neuronal terms you would have to weaken some of those connections, strengthen different connections, and that fine tuning of your brain circuits is is a is a difficult thing to achieve and does just again require those hours and hours of practice with appropriate attention and motivation. Mm -hmm. But has the strengthening and weakening been actually been observed? Has it been in, in between yes, cells? Yes, yeah, so scientists have a very good understanding of, of exactly what's going on. When we, so when we talk about strengthening of connections between cells, that's something that's very, very well characterized. So you can do experiments um, with single cells where you can in, um, 
where you can set up types of changes between connections. So the classical type of change that's been very well studied is something called uh, long-term potentiation, or LTP, which is a way in which you strengthen the connections between the cells such that the input from cell A will produce a bigger response in cell B, cell B after this repetitive training. And you can set this up in a lab to study beautifully and look at all of the chemicals and pathways that are involved in that. But it's thought that exactly that type of uh, synaptic modification of that strengthening of a connection is what underlies a lot of a lot of learning and memory. Nice. Well, let me summarize again. So, so no critical period, um, uh, no special skills, uh, just the brain's potential to produce motor activity, but a lot of training, and the uh, possibility of uh, reversing the training. But scientifically unaddressed uh, is the question of why it is that when you stop training for a while, then things revert to a situation where you are not as good. Because this is, this is quite interesting. I mean, if you, if you, are a, uh, if you listen to music, uh, if you don't listen to music for several months, it won't affect things. I, I am surprised how often I remember the tunes which I've heard years ago. Um, I don't have to train for that. So there must be some significant difference. In yes, yes, but it's, I mean, it's one of these interesting features of human memory. So you, you may well remember a tune that uh, you heard many, many years ago, but you probably can't remember what you had for breakfast last Tuesday mm -hmm. because it's a very unimportant detail in the yes. um, endless sequence of events that makes up your life. So there are clearly certain memories which are very... Um, attentional grabbing or emotionally salient, which get laid down very, very strongly in the brain, such that even decades later they can be recalled, whereas other day-to-day -day experiences um, or you know, half-hearted practice of a motor skill, let's say, will not have the same ingrained effect on those brain connections. So while talking about memory, I'm quite interested in the, in the question of motor memory. Is, can we speak of a motor memory? Yes, I mean, I the think sequence that is uh, uh, not just walking, which is almost mm -hmm. reflexive, but, but uh, say a sequence in, in swimming, which is especially effective, mm -hmm. or in playing golf or, or, one of, or in tennis. Yes, I mean, I think we can think of, um, of motor memory like any other type of memory. And I think <clears> this, the, this way of thinking about connection, strengthening connections between cells or connections between representations in the brain is what underlies all of these different types of learning and memory. So if you think of learning a, a swimming stroke, for example, you could break that swimming stroke down into a sequence of muscle activations, into, into a group of muscle activations that have to occur in a specific sequence in, in time. How that is achieved by your brain is you know, activation of particular populations of cells, one after another, and the connections, the synapses between those cells will be strengthened every time you practice that stroke, those connections between the cells will be, will be strengthened by these chemical cascades that we, that we understand very well. So that is a motor memory. It's a, so a motor memory, like any memory, isn't something that you can point to. It's not like going to a library and retrieving a specific book which represents that um, particular motor memory, but it's uh, if you like, it's implicit in the connections between those cells. But uh, if I, now I must talk, stop talking about tennis and Roger Federer. Let's take a great skier, Jean-Claude Keely or somebody. Uh, does he remember uh, uh, the sort of motor sequence he's got to apply to? Or well, there's a difference between him consciously remembering it and thinking about it versus... <coughs> Uh, his brain remembering it such that there's a trace of all of those hours of practice in his brain. So, you know, one of, I don't think it's the case that he would be consciously thinking about every aspect of that movement whenever it's produced. One of the things that characterizes very, very highly practiced movements or any skill is that they become what we call automatic. So by definition, what that means is that you're not paying attention to every aspect of the movement and that you could be doing something else at the same time mm. and it wouldn't affect your um, performance of that movement. So and it's only after many, many hours of skill, that, uh, of practice, that these movements become automatic. Um, but one of the things, actually, interestingly, that differentiates between elite sports people and, and regular folks is, is the level at which that automaticity kicks in. And somewhat counterintuitively, it seems that elite sports people, uh, that automatic, automaticity kicks in at a much, much higher level. So what that means is that as they're going through this sort of mundane level of performance, 
they're still paying a lot of attention and doing this movement very, very consciously. And it's not until they've reached this yes. very elite level of performance that they decide, OK, this is good enough now. I'll, I'll allow this to become automatic. Whereas you or I trying to learn uh, the new tennis stroke would, would allow our brains to become automatic at a much, much lower level. Mm -hmm. um, so let me, let, let, I'm quite interested to ask you about improvisation, which I think is a very interesting topic. But uh, the, the greatest tennis match I have ever watched was between uh, Bjorn Borg and Gerolaitis. It was a fantastic affair. What impressed me about that match was that there was an awful lot of improvisation going on. Would you like to say something about both improvisation? Well, is there I, anything to say about it? <laughs> Any more not, than there is I'm about the other kind of... I'm not aware of it, having been systematically studied, but I think, again, what characterizes an expert in any domain, whether it's sports, science, literature, is partly sort of creativity and improvisation. So anyone can train to do as they're told if they have the motivation to put in the training, but perhaps what gives people that edge is the ability to you know, creatively come up with a novel response in a completely new situation that you haven't been trained And for. possibly defy the training. Yes, right, because oh. the circumstances have changed. You're in a situation that you've never trained for and you have to yes. come up with a new yes. response. Okay, now uh, let, uh, we've been talking about memory. I'd like to go back to the nerve cells and regeneration. Uh, the, the Cajal statement that the, the... But what happens in the developing nervous system is got a surplus production of cells. Uh, these cells, many of them die off. Others are organized into the adult nervous system. And according to Cajal, nothing happens after that. Now, Joseph Altman, uh, the Hungarian-American uh, scientist, in the 1960s was working in the wilderness. No one believed him when he said that uh, there is a production of new cells in the adult brain. And he concentrated on the hippocampus. And of course, uh, Fred Gage and others have since uh, uh, I mean, it's now become big industry, really, neuroplasticity. Why is it the hippocampus that is such a favored region for the birth of new cells? The hippocampus, by the way, is, is, is part of the brain located deep inside the temporal lobe. It's uh, uh, very important in, in memory and very important in emotional responses and, and in space uh, mm -hmm. uh, perception as well. Yeah, so it does seem that there's something unusually special about the hippocampus in this regard. So it's a, spe a specific part of the hippocampus, isn't it? Yes, the dentate, so gyrus. The dentate gyrus of the hippocampus seems to be one of the very, very few brain regions where, uh, uncontroversially, new neurons are, um, are generated in adult life. So it seems that, so it, as you say, in, in the um, developing brain, new neurons are generated throughout the nervous system very, very prolific, prolifically. In the adult, new neurons are produced, so they're still produced, they're produced in the ventricles, in the fluid-filled spaces in the middle of the brains, and then they, but they migrate along a couple of very specific routes, one of which goes to the olfact olfactory bulb, which is a very primitive sort of smell centre of the brain, and then the other route ends up in this part of the hippocampus. Um, but so, so, so in my brain currently, are there cells being produced in, in my hippocampus? They're not in my visual cortex, they're not my, in my intellectual centres, that's for sure. So there, there are lots, I think there are lots of factors which influence the amount of what's called neurogenesis, so the birth of these new neurons in the adult brain. Uh, and some of those, so age is one. So the older we get, the fewer new cells are generated. But then there are things that we can do to enhance the number of cells that are generated. So physical activity, again, keeps cropping up. So, but physical activity has been shown in animals to enhance neurogenesis. Um, and in humans? Uh, Is there any evidence in humans of that? Um, of, of the neurogenesis, it's, it's very difficult to study. There is evidence that um, physical exercise in humans increases the size of the hippocampus. I see. Which could be driven by um, growth of new neurons, could be driven by other factors like um, uh, expansion of the blood vessels. So mm -hmm. there are various different mechanisms or various different routes by which increasing your physical activity might enhance your brain function. Yeah. But there are definitely things to it. In animals, it's shown that increasing physical activity, even in adult rats, increases the amount, the birth of new neurons in the hippocampus. Um, it increases blood flow in the hippocampus, uh, and that's associated with better brain function. These, uh, before I do that, uh, there is a question which I, I, I would like to clear up, because I'm not clear about it in my mind, and I'm sure many of you would be interested to, in having the answer to that to this question, is there any truth that past the age of 18, we lose thousands of cells every day? 
I hope not. <laughs> I don't know. I don't believe it, but but this is bandied about. It's one of these old wives' tales. I don't yes. know. Yeah. The, so, I, so you, I mean, we did, it, without doubt, our brains sadly. Dec- I wouldn't say it was that. I mean, certainly. So I'm far more familiar with the literature from brain imaging experiments in mm-hmm. humans, where we can't count individual cells, but we get an idea of <coughs> the health of the brain from these much cruder measures, just looking at its overall size, and it's and other measures, and it is true that in older age the brain starts to decline but interestingly actually some aspects of it continue to develop into at least into late adolescence and early adulthood so the the connecting pathways the white matter of the brain continue to develop even into early to mid 20s but unfortunately once we get past the sort of into middle aged and later it's a pretty steady downward slope so the brain is effectively shrinking a little bit decade decade by decade actually shrinks actually shrink. So if you were to take, um, I haven't actually done this, but I, I could do it in myself because I've been scanned quite a few times over the last mm-hmm. 15, 20 years. And I think if I were to be brave enough to look at those images, say, this <laughs> year, I would probably start to see a, right. a gradual decline. So certainly if you look across a population from about, um, you know, from middle age onwards, there's a, there's a slow decline which gets steeper and steeper as we get older. So we're, we're faced with that and there's, uh, but... Again, there are things that we can do uh, to some extent to not to not to halt that decline by any means, but certainly to slow its rate. Yes. So peop- this is a very very active area uh, area of investigation because as as a population as we get older, um, problems of later life like dementia, cognitive decline, for example, will become increasingly heavy burden on society as more yeah. and more of us live to the ages of 80 and beyond. So. It's a, it's a very hot topic at the moment, what we can do to just slow that um, late life decline. But it is, so, so the, the answer is that it is not clear that cells decline, at the, uh, we lose cells in, in the thousands after the age of 18, but what we do know is that we do generate new cells. We do continue to generate new cells. Yes. Um, is it not paradoxical that, that these cells are generated in the hippocampus? Well, what, that's one of the favorite places. Would that be correct? Yes. And yet that's also uh, one of the places that's most affected in cases like Alzheimer's disease, which, which leads to a loss of memory. Yes, it's interesting. It seems that this, um, you know, there's a special role for the hippocampus throughout life as being uh, a center, if you like, for, or a key structure certainly for memories, and it has this special ability to, uh, to generate new neurons, and yet it's also somehow especially vulnerable um, to disease later on in life, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that it's well understood how those, how those things connect. So is there any other part of the brain where you have a, a birth of new cells or a regeneration of axons and dendrites, which is quite as prolific as in the uh, hippocampus? So the, so the birth of new... Well, so there's interesting distinctions. The birth of new cells Mm -hmm. uh, seems to happen in lots of places, but there's a very important distinction between neurons, the sort of classic nerve cells, versus other types of cells that are found in the brain. And there's a big controversy in the field as to whether or not areas outside of the hippocampus are able to generate new neurons specifically. So there is areas outside the hippocampus, but the hippocampus can. The hippocampus can, Mm -hmm. but areas, particularly in the cortex, so that the sheet on the outside of the brain, which is where many of these sort of higher cognitive areas mm-hmm. are located. Some laboratories have claimed to show evidence for neurogenesis in adults, in adult <coughs> monkeys typically in these cortical areas, but this is a very controversial finding, and my understanding is that there's debates rage among these um, neuroscientists as to whether what's being measured is actually new neurons or other processes, for example, growth of these new, what's called glial cells, so the supporting cells of the mm-hmm. brain which are very important, and mm. in my opinion, it would be interesting if they, if they were um, proliferating in older yes. age, but they're, not, but they're not neurons. Yes. Um, um, th- th- there is a, uh, this is getting off the subject a little, but quite interesting, and there is a question of, of injecting the, the hippocampus with stem cells, mm-hmm. and this, this apparently has got some restorative uh, consequences. Is this true? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are trials happening in many, many different neurodegenerative disorders where you know doctors try to introduce these um, immature cells into the brain in the hope that they will um, develop into mature neurons and find the right connections. It's a very, very hard thing to do because obviously you have to hope that these neurons uh, specialise to be the right type of cell, that their processes uh, grow properly, end up 
uh, grow and develop to the right places. So it's a very, very hard thing to do. I mean, I think that there's a lot of potential there. There have been some very interesting, some very um, encouraging early results, but I think it's, uh, you know, it's early, it's, it's early days. Yes. Well, uh, so, so, so we do have, uh, at least in the, in the hippocampus, the birth new cells, probably nowhere in the neocortex, do you think? I think I'm not uh, well qualified to judge, but am I, it's a very controversial topic. My, my take on it is that there seem to be more people in the no camp than there are in the S camp. Yes, but there is <clears throat> room for, I mean, I think it's, it's known that there is considerable uh, 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 Development of new synapses, absolutely. Uh, so the, the new idea, connections. Yes. Yeah, so the idea way. of existing <coughs> cells changing their structure with learning, I think, is is beautifully well established in the cortex. So there are techniques now with which people can directly observe the this dynamic turnover of synapses um, in a living brain. So they do this in, in in rats typically. So if you, for example, have a setup whereby a, a rat is learning a new mo movement skill. So one class task, they would be trained to reach for a single food pellet. It's quite a hard thing for a rat to do. It's not a natural behavior for them. So it might take them um, quite a number of days to learn how to produce this mm -hmm. reach. So you can think of it as analogous to the sports person learning a new tennis stroke, let's say. You can use a, a very sophisticated type of uh, microscope and imaging to visualize a, um, an area of the brain where you're literally looking at these new synapses coming and going. So the synapses, these junction points of the brain, are located on tiny little processes called dendritic spines. So each of our, our neurons would have a sort of branching tree of dendrites. And on each of the dendrites, there would be uh, many, many thousands of tiny little spines. And on the end of these spines, there would be a synapse. With this type of imaging, you can see these spines coming and going. And in all of us now, there would be spines growing and retracting. But that does seem to be tied to learning. So when the rat's there, mm -hmm learning this new movement sequence, you see a net increase in the number of spines, specifically in the area that's doing this learning, and the amount of new spines produced seems to relate to how much they're learning. So the, the rats that are learning the most are the rats that are producing the most new okay. connections in that okay. brain area. So that seems to be prolific all over yes. the place. And in cases like Alzheimer's disease, is there actually a loss of neurons in the hippocampus? or no neuron gen new, new neuron generating what yeah, so it? I think that there's, there's definitely um, extensive neuronal loss and there's, there's um, accumulation of basically bits of debris which will affect neuronal function so there's mm. dysfunction there's degeneration mm -hmm. there's loss mm. you know it, it, it always seems to be very interesting to me that when we address questions like Alzheimer's disease we are always addressing what's lost but equally impressive is what's actually not lost. I mean, to a very advanced stage, uh, Alzheimer's patients can talk, uh, they can carry out their movement, they can, they, they might forget that they lock the door, but they, they, they can lock it, and that's mm -hmm. a, a considerable skill, and I don't think we have addressed enough of this, uh, this question. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I want to move on to, to the last section, but before that, I, uh, it's not my habit to make a joke, but I'm going to make a joke about memory, about two, I think I can afford that to do this joke it's about elder people um, uh, playing golf and one of them says to the other, I, I'm sorry, I, my eyesight is failing and I cannot see where the ball goes. Can you? And the other one says, yes, I can. So just, Shall we play? They play, throws the ball. Says, Did you see where it went? Says, yes, yes. I, can you tell me? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Let me... Uh, uh, go to another uh, 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 part of the discussion which, which I'd like to uh, address before we ask questions from the audience. In training uh, for sports, to what extent do you actually have to train? To what extent do you watch? And how much just watching somebody who's very proficient actually uh, uh, reorganize your brain. It was a nice thought, isn't it, as we all prepare to watch two weeks of Olympics that maybe yes. just sitting in front of the TV. We're all hopeful, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, well, it's an interesting question because there's, there's very interesting interactions between the perception of movement, particularly, and the actual production <clears throat> of that movement. So there's, there's a type of cell in the brain that's very well described called the mirror neuron. So there are certain areas of the motor system which seem to contain these mirror neurons which 
mean that they will respond, um, these cells fire, they get active when an animal produces a certain movement, but also when they see another animal produce that self same movement. So they seem to be involved both in the production of the movement and in observing that very same movement. They're very interesting because they're thought to be um, maybe a, a, um, a very an early type of that they might be able to underlie certain types of communication. So obviously in, in speech and communication, what one has to do is relate what we're producing to what um, the person that we're observing is producing. But in animals who don't have communication, you still have these types of um, mirror neurons present, and it seems that they might underlie some of the effects that have been ob that are very commonly um, used in sports training, for example, this idea that just imagining uh, yourself producing the perfect free kick might in itself increase your chances of producing that free kick. So I think that um, many sports people anecdotally report that they will visualise themselves you know, producing the perfect penalty or the perfect free kick, and that helps them to, to produce it. And I think that the, brain, the way the brain responds when we either observe somebody else producing an action or when we imagine producing that action is actually very, very similar to how it would respond when we, when we generate that action ourselves. Other than that final um, command to the muscles, much of the brain activity is the same. And it seems that that system is very, very sensitive to expertise. So there have been experiments done, for example, with dancers, showing that if you take ballet dancers and ask them to observe videos of um, other dancers producing certain ballet moves, then that mirror system will particularly uh, strongly activate when the moves that they're observing are moves with which they have expertise. So, for example, you can look at male and female ballet dancers, and the females might be actually, if anything, more used to observing the male moves, and yet their mirror system most most strongly activates when they see the female moves that they that they have expertise with. So it seems that there's this sort of um, simulation system of the brain, if you like, that um, yes. itself can entrain the motor system. So, so, so that by just by watching. Uh, you can't actually, uh, but the, but it is not known whether the cells are themselves are modified. This is a ob uh, behavioural observation. Yeah, so it's, it seems that um, imagining yourself performing a movement to some extent in, improves your ability. So the sports psychologists certainly think that improves your ability to produce the movement. In the clinical setting, it's used as well. So if you take um, stroke patients who are completely uh, completely paralysed, there's some evidence, um, not a huge amount, but a small amount of evidence to suggest oh. that simply imagining producing the movements, because that's activating the brain systems involved in movement, that can help to at least very slightly facilitate recovery in those patients who are, un who are initially unable to produce any movements. I heard in the, uh, during the football match uh, recently, uh, one of the players say on television that he had watched 20 hours of footage of the opponent's game before mm. he went. Now that, of course, is to prepare his strategy, but I wonder the extent to which it also uh, modified or, or trained him in a slightly different way. I just wonder. Uh, yes, definitely. And that the, the, him watching that footage would be completely different to you or I watching that footage. So because he is, yes. because he's an expert in that domain, he would have watched it in a very different way. So there's another in, very interesting study in basketball players showing that when you have the players observe um, basketball players taking shots. Firstly, they're much more accurate than um, non-players at predicting whether or not the ball's going to go in, which isn't particularly surprising. But if you wire them up to a, what's called an EMG machine, so a machine to me measure their muscle responses, then what you see um, only in these expert basketball players is that even before the player on the video releases the ball, the observing basketball player is activating the muscles which will determine the success or failure of that basketball shot. So it seems that they you know, inadvertently and unconsciously are activating, are mirroring what they're seeing in the observer to produce that sequence of movements in their own brain and, and even to the extent of the muscles. So the, the hand isn't moving but you're sub-threshold, below threshold activating those muscles and that's allowing them to predict whether or not the ball's going to go in. Well, this must be the same in the theatre. I heard one, uh, an actor recently who was playing Hamlet, uh, saying that he had uh, watched uh, hours of Laurence Olivier doing it. Uh, I wondered to what extent it... Uh, I wonder it was always a good thing, actually, because it perhaps inhibits. Okay, so, so we have uh, explored the field. I think the interesting thing that, that has come out of this for me is uh, how much 
Uh, how, how many interesting questions there are to ask in sports uh, medicine and in, in terms of training, in terms of rewiring and, and um, uh, the plasticity of nervous system. And it seems to me that we're just, we've just skimmed the, the surface, really. Uh, there's an enormous amount of very interesting things to do and to learn about. And let me just end up, uh, before I invite questions, uh, ask you, how do you, uh, do you, do you see that the, the quality, see the quality of tennis, when I was very young, is very different the quality of tennis today. Quality of tennis today depends upon brute force, uh, very strong rackets, and, and things like that. There isn't the, the, the rallies are not as evident as they used to be before. Do you think that the quality of sport, uh, we're, do you think we're doing enough in research that will change the quality of playing and sports? Well, sport definitely is changing, whether it's for better or for worse. If you take sports in which you can compare performance over the years, like um, races, for example, mm -hmm. when you have times over the years, every Olympic sport of that kind, performance has increased over the last hundred years, without exception. So obviously some of that is due to you know, equipment, trainer, manufacturers, and things like that, yeah. which are facilitating performance. But those developments in, um, in, in equipment can't explain all of the improvements in performance. It seems that there's something <coughs> different, whether it's partly to do with our physiology changing over that time, people are getting you know, taller, stronger, better nourished, or whether it's partly to do with the strategies that people employ. So as you say, maybe in tennis, the nature of the game has changed. It's not just that people are getting faster or stronger, but the, the tactics change and the, the training strategies change. So it's... You know, the, the, the sports training does evolve over time, which affects the nature of the sport itself. But if, if, we, if we were if we were to reach a stage where we understand that some kind of intervention, of course there have, there have been interventions in terms of drugs and things, but mm -hmm. if some kind of intervention which is healthy uh, uh, to increase the plasticity of the brain, then, then the nature of sport would change in a, in a different way, wouldn't it? Yeah, so I mean, there's very, many interventions that we know should um, facilitate plasticity. So it's a very interesting um, ethical dilemma as to whether or not one should apply that in the context of sports training. So, for example, in my lab, we do lots of studies on stroke rehabilitation. We try to enhance brain plasticity through things like brain stimulation, for example, mm -hmm. using electrical currents to stimulate the brain in such a way that plasticity is more likely to occur. If you couple that stimulation with um, movement training physiotherapy, then patients' response to that physiotherapy gets, gets, uh, gets stronger. So for a given dose of physiotherapy, you can boost response to that dose by stimulating the patient's brain. You could do the same thing with a drug that enhances plasticity. So it's then a very interesting question in the context of sports. If I were to, you know, train the GB rowing team and they're on their ergometers wired up to a brain stimulation machine, the, liter the data would predict that they would learn quicker and that mm -hmm. they would reach a better level of performance. Is that the same as them taking a drug to enhance their performance on the competition day or not? Um, I think it's a very interesting question. It's an interesting question, question. to discuss. Uh, let me say, you, you alluded to the fact that, that uh, uh, training is good for health and good for memory. And there's an interesting uh, news item this morning that, that uh, perhaps lack of training, lack of exercise, kills as many people every year as obesity and, and smoking. Mm -hmm. Now, Let's have some questions. Many, many questions. Um, are leaps of innovation or genius? Are leaps of innovation or genius more likely or exclusively likely to happen in a younger brain? And is there anything you can ingest, such as vitamins or something like that, that can help to, to counteract the aging of the brain in that respect, in terms of innovation? My ex personal experience is nothing counteracts the effects of aging. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm not sure of, of the literature on whether... I mean, <clears throat> experience suggests that innovation can occur throughout life and that there are certain individuals who continue to make innovations. I, mean, I think it varies a lot between different fields of expertise. So classically, for example, mathematicians tend to peak much, much younger than other types of scientists. Uh, who tend to peak um, later. So I think there are certain types of thinking which are particularly efficient in young brains, but there are other types of 
insight or wisdom, if you like, which might benefit from the experience of an older brain. So I think it would depend very, very much on the, the domain in which that um, insight was, was, was needed to happen. I mean, in terms of whether we can take particular vitamins, I think you mentioned, to f facilitate that, I think that's, a, that's an open question. So the idea of um, cognitive enhancement through, through drugs or through vitamins, I think, is a very active area of research. There are certainly some drugs which might increase uh, concentration or attention. Um. I was thinking more of natural things. So I attended a lecture at Oxford that said that intense levels of vitamin C can, can actually help in Alzheimer's um, patients. That was only a year or so ago. Yes, I mean, I think that, you know, there have been certain studies which have suggested positive, which have suggested positive effects. Um, so there might be there might be some instances, you know, things like fish oils have been shown to have some positive effects in uh, in dyslexics or on, on violent behaviour in um, criminals. So there's you know there's many isolated studies, but I think we don't as yet understand well enough what the mechanisms are that underlie all those different effects. I I, I don't think the evidence for vitamin C uh, helping Alzheimer's memory is is, is good myself. I, I, if it had been good, it would have been used much more extensively. Okay. But it is, it is worth reminding ourselves that some of our greatest uh, have achieved their greatest at, at the ripe old age. Uh, Churchill is one of them, de Gaulle is another, Gauss is a third, and uh, the Japanese painter Hokusai said, don't take anything I did before the age of 70 seriously. <laughs> it's interesting. Does this have another? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Skills to recognize the uh, pattern is developed the, uh, in a different way for the uh, kind of footballers. So, the, uh, for example, the uh, midfielder of a footballer, at a glance or quick look, the, uh, they can uh, identify who is there and who and who and who and who and who and many, many people there and learning which way. But we cannot recognize the in uh, less than one second the who and who and who are there. So in our case, we need to uh, identify the how many people there or count there. But in the case of the professional footballer like a Messi, they can uh, quick look and then the, they can identify who are running which part. So in get in order to uh, uh, acquire such kind of the uh, uh, talent or skill. I guess there is a certain age limit to uh, obtain or acquire such kind of skill. It's pattern recognition. And also I heard about the uh, kind of the experiment with the chimpanzee. The, uh, sometimes the uh, uh, chimpanzee can uh, recognize the number of pattern on the screen. And the, uh, they can push a button like uh, one, two, three, four, something. And it's much better than the some uh, yeah, human being, yeah, even uh, better than myself. So, the, uh, is there any kind of general understanding that the uh, such kind of instantaneous, instantaneous recognition of a pattern <laughs> is developed by the uh, certain age or the uh, particular mm -hmm. manner? Well, I, I'm sure. Too. So, to check, I guess, so you're saying that um, older people are better at recognizing, at very rapidly recognizing a pattern, like counting yeah. the number of people in a room, whereas... I think the uh, brain, brain is different from ourselves. The, uh, I think the, uh, many people the, uh, sitting here uh -huh. has got the logical manner of thinking, but the, uh, not so good at the instantaneous recognition. But in the case yes. of the uh, football pitch, they may... <laughs> be not so good at the uh, logical thinking, but very, very good at the uh, instantaneous recognition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's definitely sort of uh, different domains of ability and expertise, so that yeah. people uh, who are good at one type of thinking, for example, might be poor at another type of thinking, So, yeah, which can give you some counterintuitive results. Like, as you say, that perhaps chimpanzees are better at certain types of... Yeah, my question is, the, uh, yeah, is there any kind of age limit? Uh, let, let me say on that that there, there, of course you can you can develop your visual expertise. And I'm, I'd be surprised if a tennis player and a football player were not proficient, were not more proficient than me uh, in detecting the movement of the other players and balls. I, I'm sure. Yeah, and, this fact, is a, and I think it's been shown that in in sports where 
people have to rapidly process visual information like racket sports, for example. They have quicker res early visual responses. So you can measure visual right. responses um, using EEG, measuring the brain waves, and those early visual right. responses are faster, yes. specifically in sports people who are in these rapid responding sports. Yes. Yeah. OK, uh, yes, sir. Would you say that someone who spends years practicing to be a brilliant football player or tennis player is basically changing the chemistry in the brain? And if it's a chemical change in the brain, could you imagine in the long distant future, because Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge, could you imagine in the future that they would be transferable from one to another, just the chemistry? Uh, and if it's going to be sooner, could I volunteer now? <laughs> Um, so my take on that would be that the, uh, that the prolonged training would be unlikely to change the brain chemistry in a long-term way. I think short-term dynamic changes in brain chemistry are absolutely critical for learning and plasticity to, plasticity to occur, and that maybe somebody's, in someone who's highly practiced, those chemical changes might happen much, much more efficiently, much quicker or to a much greater degree when they're undergoing the training. But I don't think that you would see um, long-term stable differences in brain chemistry as a result of that training. It might well be the case that individual differences in brain chemistry to begin with will determine our chances of becoming a sports person. So for sure, individual differences in brain chemistry influence things like mood and anxiety, which themselves would probably have a big influence on whether or not somebody is motivated to, um, to participate in, in very intensive training regimes. Thank you. Oh, yes? You give us a fascinating insight into the role of mirror neurons in the motor cortex. To what extent, to what extent are mirror neurons a feature of the motor cortex? So there, so there's particular... In case people did not hear, to what extent are mirror neurons a feature of motor cortex? So there's particular areas of the motor system where mirror neurons seem to be <coughs> most concentrated. So it's actually the premotor cortex, an area called the premotor cortex, which is just in front of the motor cortex, which is where, which is one of the regions where you'd expect to see a lot of these uh, mirror neurons, more so than the motor cortex itself. So the motor cortex is actually sending the signals to the spinal cord. It seems like some of these, if you like, higher areas in the motor system uh, contain these interesting mi mirror neurons. Uh, there is a point which, which has never ceased to interest and surprise me. There is no direct connection between the visual areas, the early visual areas, and the motor cortex. So if I want to uh, uh, play football or volleyball, etc., uh, the visual information for me to hit the ball does not go straight from my visual cortex to my motor cortex. It goes via a circuitous route. And why it does that is, is, a, is an interesting question which has not been resolved and which has never ceased to fascinate me. I don't know the answer. Let's have, yes? Uh, you mentioned several times in our talk that sports is better for your brain and it provides for the better functioning of the brain. But I have a specific <coughs> example in my head which I can't just get rid of. And it's the um, study that was actually done on London taxi drivers. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know, it's actually becoming a classical example in neuroscience books. And, uh, so um, you probably know the study, but basically what they found is that over the long practice and passing the knowledge test, you can see the clear pattern. That specific part of the brain, I can't remember which one is it, is actually much bigger than the hippocampus. Campus, exactly. And, uh, but it actually comes in a cost because the other parts of the brain actually become smaller. So mm -hmm. is really doing sports better for you? Or to me, it seems that sports works as a meditation factor that, that helps you know, memory and attention. Mm -hmm. on what are thoughts on that? There's a really good question. So there is this really interesting observation that taxi drivers, uh, a particular part of their hippocampus is larger. And now it's been shown that you know, as they acquire the knowledge, it gets larger. So it does really seem to be related to that training. It's interesting. Um, it's not clear to me that that relates in a straightforward way to what we were discussing about the effects of physical activity on hippocampus and hippocampal neurogenesis. But one of the special things about the hippocampus is that it seems to be particularly important for spatial navigation and spatial memory. And obviously, navigating around the streets of London is a very, a very, very classic uh, test of one's spatial navigation. And to be able to do that is becoming an expert in spatial navigation. So I think that in the taxi driver's example, 
the reason why their posterior hippocampus is, big, is bigger is because they are extreme experts of spatial navigation. Um, but it's also the case that if you were just to take up um, physical exercise, physical activity, that would um, increase the, the, the size of your hippocampus, but presumably wouldn't give you an advantage in spatial navigation. So there's different things at work there, I think. In a, in a more general uh, context, I think your question probably can be translated into the, the uh, supposition which I have that if you are very proficient, let's forget about taxi drivers, if you're very proficient in mathematics, uh, you probably are neglecting other things. I mean, mathematicians are often, uh, 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 let me be there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, right, let's have another question. Uh, yes. My question is about um, cases of neurodegenerative disease and specifically Parkinson's disease. How can we take what we know about plasticity and the response to injury and apply it to those p patients? And specifically, do you think that vigorous uh, specialized athletic training and participation in sport could be of benefit to those patients? I think so. it's a good question. Um, it certainly seems to be that, that, uh, that um, aerobic exercise has benefits across a wide range of different disorders and, part, and there have been some studies done in, in Parkinson's disease. So it seems that uh, you know, being physically active um, has some benefits for the brain, which might, which could potentially be quite non-specific, that they're increasing blood flow to the brain, and that's generally a good thing. It produces various chemicals that help with brain, um, with survival of neurons, for example. Uh, so I think that generally physical, physical exercise would would help. But in terms of um, training, whether you could, in a targeted way, train people with neurodegenerative disease to somehow um, counteract the, the, the effects of the disease on their specific movements is, is a really interesting one. And I think it's really hard in the case of a progressive neurodegenerative disease. It's in a way it's much harder than the case of stroke. So with stroke, there's, a, there's an acute insult, there's an amount of damage that's been done which is completely irreversible, but it's not uh, characterized as being progressive. So you have a stable playing field with which you can play with what's left of the brain to try and um, relearn those movements. Things like Parkinson's disease are progressive. Another tricky thing about Parkinson's is, is that it affects the very neuronal machinery that underlies certain types of motor learning. So people with Parkinson's um, might find it particularly difficult to, to learn new, new kinds of movements. So it's a hard case, but definitely physical activity um, seems to be pretty generically beneficial. Hey, I, I really think I should ask this question because everybody is interested in learning about it. What are the chances of having an effective cure in the coming 10 to 20 years for things like Parkinson's disease? We've spent an awful lot of money on it. Um, we have acquired an awful lot of knowledge about the motor system, and yet this seems to be an intractable problem. Is there any hope? I mean, I think that neuroscientists are pursuing lots of different avenues. So I think there's obviously there's a there's a search for for drug interventions which might have some help. Stem cell therapy you mentioned earlier, you know, there's a potential that you could maybe um, inject some new cells that if they were able to, to develop properly could, could help. But in all of these cases, one of the problems is that you're faced with this continual progressive disease. I'm not aware of um, anything which has hope in the, in the short term for, for halting that progression. I think what you can do is try and shore up the defences so that you minimise the effects of that progressive neurodegeneration, but I'm not aware of um, a, anything that's, that's um, suggested it's possible to, to halt it completely. Yes. yes. <coughs> I've got a high-level question, which I'm not sure you've answered. What's the brain for? <laughs> uh, are you addressing... It must be to you, this question. <laughs> <laughs> um... That's an interesting, so different neuroscientists will give you very different answers to that. Um, I would argue that the brain allows us to act in our environment, which, you know, the end result of that action is often a movement, but in order to produce our actions, or our movements involves an awful lot of other mental functions. So to act on the world, we have to perceive it, we have to evaluate it, we have to make a decision about what action we're going to produce. But ultimately, um, 
it's all about producing those actions, I think, whether that be a movement or whether that be a, um, a, a verbal response. But may I uh, also answer your question? I, I absolutely agree with you. I think the brain is there for us to be able to take action, to have a motor response, which is why the motor cortex is so interesting. However, you can only undertake these uh, actions, you can only have a motor response if you have knowledge about what you want to respond to, and therefore the brain is also there for knowledge. So I would say that it is motor response primarily, but you, only can, you can only have a motor response if you know what you're going to respond to. So it brings in the question of knowledge. But there is a, perhaps a sotto voce in your question, uh, something really quite interesting, which is that if you look at a goldfish, which has got a tiny brain, it has got very good color constancy. In other words, it can tell you that something is green even when it reflects more red light in the natural context. Now, for humans and for monkeys to do that, they have a huge uh, part of their brain devoted just to that, which makes you wonder why you need this kind of extravagant expenditure when the goldfish can do it so effectively. So it's an interesting <laughs> So, uh, yes. Given the success of the Kenyan runners in the marathon, could it be that their success can be put down either to genetic factors or environmental and lifestyle? And if people already have a history of achievements in certain levels of sport, could that confidence markedly affect their performance? Yeah, I think you raise lots and lots of interesting questions there. So there are definitely, you know, there are definitely certain. Um, uh, genetic differences which might increase one's chances of being a successful a athlete. So those might affect the body. So, for example, there's a case of a, a Finnish skier who has a particular genetic mutation that affects the concentration of haemoglobin in his blood, which basically means that oxygen um, gets more efficiently uh, to where it needs to go. So there might be physical differences which could then be more concentrated in a particular population. There are also genetic differences which might give you an advantage in terms of how well you could learn. Um, you know, maybe in long distance running, there's less scope for, for, for learning being an, an important factor. But um, there, the, you know, there's some scope for some genetic difference. But I think the other things you mentioned to do with, almost to do with expectation or you know, cultural differences, that if, if a particular um, group or a particular country, a particular culture values very highly a particular type of sport, then that in itself might might give them a competitive advantage. And there's many, many if, examples, I guess, of countries excelling in a, in a particular domain, and whether that's because they've strategically thought, you know, we could exploit this, or whether they're partly exploiting you know, physical characteristics which are, which are more predominant in, the, in that country. Um, I'm not sure if it's, if it's known. There is an interesting uh, comment, which, which, which we'll end on, which um, relates to your question of uh, Bjorn Borg, when he won Wimbledon the fourth time. They, a reporter asked him, said, what else do you want? You've got money, you've won the Wimbledon four times at a record. What do you want? He said, I want to win it a fifth time. <laughs> and that is, I think, uh, a reflection of the success breeding success, but also a reflection of the sports and Olympic spirit, which, which uh, infects us because we also want to be uh, achieving things in our own domains. Now, I want to um, thank you so much for coming from Oxford and, and, and giving us your knowledge and your expertise, all of you for attending, and you're all welcome to cross the road and have some wine uh, at uh, University College in the, North, uh, in the South Cloisters, is it? In the Cloisters. Anyway, you'll be directed. Thank you all very much. Thank you.